this is a, the third in a series of press conferences that uh, we've called in, um, in the, uh, the wake of uh, the inauguration the other night to, uh, to push forward some major initiatives uh, that uh, we're, uh, we've launched. So the, on day one, after the inauguration, we uh, renounced uh, our efforts to um, stabilize, help stabilize distressed neighborhoods by installing a, a new camera network in and, and, and discrete places around the city. And new Bedford is a place where it's had made tremendous progress, but we want to make sure that every neighborhood is coming along um, uh, with the growth of the, the city. So that's, that's really important, and it all starts with public safety. Yesterday, or actually two days ago, we skipped yesterday because of the storm, uh, Wednesday, uh, we met to talk about how we can pay for uh, all the things that are important to us, um, uh, including public safety and schools and everything else, by making sure that uh, health care, municipal health care costs don't get out of control. And so uh, it is important that uh, in, along uh, those lines that we have, uh, that we avail ourselves of every uh, lever that the state affords us, which includes the ability to go to an arbitrator if we can't agree with uh, public employee unions on the terms of their uh, of their health care plans. And so we proposed the, the adoption of uh, so-called Section 21 of the Municipal Health Care Reform Act uh, of 2010 uh, toward that end. And that, that will be something that uh, those, both of those items are things that the City Council will be taking up uh, in earnest in the, the weeks ahead. Uh, today we talk about, again, about a measure that will uh, help us deal with and stabilize uh, distressed neighborhoods. And that has to do not so much with uh, criminal enforcement, police work per se, but with code enforcement. Um, our, our city uh, a few years ago was, uh, there were a couple of major changes uh, that, that came out of uh, the financial crisis of 2008, but the primary one that affected us was the, the fact that all of the foreclosures led ultimately to um, the purchasing uh, of properties by folks who didn't, who would not live, did not, and would not ultimately live in them. The decline in owner occupancy in neighborhoods like the near North End, like the Ruth Street area, like a couple of other discrete areas around the city, have changed in many ways the complexion of those neighborhoods. That um, historically, those tenement um, neighborhoods had been places where. Um, where families lived, where the owner lived on the first floor, the parents, and you know, the paradigmatic examples where the parents lived on the first floor, grandparents on second, cousins on third, or some combination thereof. And now that's the exception. Um, because people tend to, those neighborhoods were self-regulating because people who live in their homes tend to take care of them better. It's, it's a, almost an immutable rule of urban living. Um, and with the decline of home ownership, those neighborhoods are not nearly as self-regulating as they have been before. And so when I came into office, one of the you know, chief things that we had to deal with is to try to stabilize those neighborhoods. And we've been very, very aggressive uh, in uh, enforcing uh, the code, the sanitary code, the building code, the fire code, and, and everything else that applies to housing in New Bedford. Um, with the leadership of John Floor, the head of our task force, and who's been in place for a long time, we have. Uh, the enforcement mechanism in the city has uh, become far more robust. Uh, the, if measure, as measured by the, the amount of fines, the, the number of fines issued, the number of fines collected, it is, it is magnitudes greater than it was years ago, and it's forced uh, homeowners to fix up their properties. Um, and, and his, his folks and the task force that he's been, has had in place it deserves tremendous credit for that. But as he would tell you, uh, it isn't nearly enough. We still have a problem with uh, that is that is relegated almost exclusively to um, non-owner occupied tenement housing in the city, where uh, you know, there we have landlords who continue to shirk their responsibilities to their tenants uh, and to their neighborhoods. Um, the goal in New Bedford has always been, you know, treat the residence that you own, the, the, the house that you own, as you would your, your very own home. That, I, I think, is a very reasonable standard of, of behavior, and it's one that um, has been achieved in certain places, but not, not everywhere. Uh, today, you know, we're, we're announcing a certain set of steps that will allow us to, uh, to deal with problems that persist. And so let me, let me run through them, and I, I'll 
as needed, I'll have, uh, I'll have John come on up and, uh, and add some detail. But, you know, the first has to do um, with the, um, uh, with, with the so-called clean and lean ordinance. And I'll just go through the pictures. If you look at the set of pictures on the left, you'll see uh, examples of properties where there are big messes, messes that are, um, you know, that affect other properties, messes that might contribute or, to, to or undermine uh, public health and safety. And it's our job to make sure that those responsible for those messes clean them up. So we have a clean and lean ordinance in the city that we have used readily uh, to force people to, to go in, the property owners to go in, clean up the, the, the messes, or the city will do it for them and the city will put the, um, uh, will, will charge them for that service. We'll put, will lean their property. And we've done that countless times. The problem that we have confronted, and it's worked to a point, but the problem that we've confronted is that uh, it doesn't happen fast enough. Uh, under current uh, city law, a property owner has 14 days to do the cleanup after service has been returned to the city, right? So in other words, uh, the city serves in order to, to clean the property on the property owner, but until that service actually gets back to the city, and a lot of times these owners are hard to find, um, uh, the, the owner still has yet another 14 days to clean up the mess. That's too long. It's too long if you live next, if you live next door to that mess, you would say, why is it taking so long to clean up? And that's the reason why. So we're proposing an amendment to the clean and lean ordinance that, change, that, that, that compresses the time period to, um, to comply with a clean, a clean up order, which, so we're moving, we're proposing that, it, that the time period go from 14 days down to five days, which I think will really get some of these landlords to sit up straight and to, to make sure that their properties don't turn into something like that. The second uh, proposal is in a similar vein. Again, with a lot of non-owner occupied property in the city, um, our folks, and John would be the first one to tell you, we can't find the owners because they all live out of town. They live in, some live in the Boston area, some live in New York, some live elsewhere, some live in our suburbs. Um, and a lot of times it's, and, and, and many of the properties are owned not by people individually, but by limited liability corporations, LLCs. And so sometimes it's hard to pierce that corporate veil to figure out you know, who's behind it all. What we're trying, what we've done is we're establishing a, um, we're trying to simplify it in the most basic way uh, by requiring, and this is the proposal, by requiring non, uh, the owners of non-owner occupied property to post their, their name, their address, their telephone, a working telephone number uh, in a common area of the building so that uh, everybody knows whom to call in a problem, including code enforcement folks. That way we can track people down. That way we can figure out who's responsible and not have to go through all sorts of you know, telephone trees and, and dead ends uh, before we can actually get somebody to, to discharge their responsibility to their tenants and to their neighborhood. So that's, uh, that's, that's another big thing that we're, we're working on and that's what we're proposing. It's a simple matter uh, and, and if it's not complied with, there, as proposed, there is a, would be a $300 fine. So if, you don't put the, you're, if you're not willing to, uh, to put your name with your property, you, know, you probably shouldn't be doing business here in New Bedford in, in that way. Um, and the third, uh, the third proposal has to do with the city's problem property ordinance, which is a measure that was enacted uh, some two years ago or so by the city council uh, that um, requires property owners to pick up the tab for police responses if the property has had eight valid complaints, criminal complaints, uh, over the previous year. The prom property ordinance has had some benefit to uh, dealing with certain problem properties in the city. Uh, after three incidents, uh, a property owner would get a warning letter, and we've sent out lots of those warning letters over time, uh, and that has gotten people to, uh, to sit up straight, and we think, and, and, uh, but it's not nearly enough. The problem has been that uh, sometimes it's hard to link up the, the conduct with the property. Sometimes uh, it's, on, it's just unclear. Um, and so what we're doing so that we can actually have, be able to, to use this hammer more effectively is to lower the threshold from, from eight down to four valid complaints. 
And that way uh, we, can, we can actually start charging property owners uh, for police responses that are otherwise picked up by New Bedford's taxpayers. You know, we, that is, that's a problem that, uh, that we think is, uh, is, is solvable just with a simple tweak of the statute. Um, that is uh, a threshold of four is more consistent with uh, ordinances that other cities, similar ordinances that other cities have uh, enacted. Uh, the number eight was just, frankly, too high of a threshold, and so we're, we we're proposing to change that. Uh, we've had uh, terrific discussions about all of these uh, items with the, uh, the city council over the last uh, several weeks, and uh, I'm pleased to, to hear that uh, the council is largely supporting it, and, uh, and you know, obviously this council is going to take it up as it will the other two matters that we announced in the last couple of weeks um, soon. So. Uh, again, I, um, I'm grateful for those discussions. I think together these things will help us uh, help us stabilize these neighborhoods. Again, it just bears reemphasizing that uh, you know we we are uh, we're, we're not a city of of disparate places. We're one city. Uh, our most of the city is not only safe but thriving and, and and in a really good place right now and getting better all the time. But it, that can't be said of everywhere, and so we want to focus our attention on those places that need the most help. Put, we want to have the resources put into those neighborhoods. We want to make sure that we're, you know, we're using all the legal uh, authority at our disposal to make sure that those who have invested in those neighborhoods are doing right by the people that live there. And so with all that, uh, I want to bring up, uh, again, I want to thank John Floor certainly for for all of his efforts, and, and to thank everybody on the task force for what they do, Lindsay Montero, everybody. Uh, and I wanted to uh, ask uh, City Council, uh, or five City Councilor, uh, Scott Lima, to say uh, a few words uh, while we're here, but I also want to emphasize that I appreciate the support of both Councilors Markey uh, and Abreu uh, for, for all of these uh, initiatives. Scott? I, I think actually he met me. I mean you. Yeah, yeah. Right. So you were the designee from the last uh, right, the last right. press conference. So, <laughs> yeah. So Linda, by the way, Linda Morad, uh, City Council President, sends her regrets. She wasn't able to uh, to get here uh, today. So it will be you pinch hitting for the council It'll president. Be me. All right, Great Council. Right. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, good morning, everyone. And before I uh, I get started, I do want to recognize my colleagues in government. Ward one councilor Brad Markey, and of course Ward five councilor Scott Lima. Thank you both for being here. Look, uh, this needs to happen. Uh, I can't tell you how often uh, I'm in communication and my colleagues in government are in communication with that man's office every single week, John Floor, about properties that are in squalor, that are in disrepair. Uh, the mayor talked about this earlier. Look at those pictures. These are human beings. They do not deserve to live in those kinds of properties. These are our neighborhoods, and these are our brethren, and these are our brothers and sisters. That is completely unacceptable. There's no excuse for that in our city. And I think if we start to really uh, create more of a sense of pride in our neighborhoods, we will start generating more community pride and more investment in our neighborhoods in our city. The reality is that uh, what we've had on the books, we've been using. We've been using it very well, but we need to bring it in. We need to tighten it up a little bit because these individuals who continue to uh, own these properties and who are not community invested, they need to be held accountable. And Let's make no mistake about it. There is a direct line between this and a lot of crime in our neighborhoods. A lot of these landlords are renting to individuals from out of town who come down here because they hear there's cheap properties in New Bedford, cash money every month, no appropriate background or credit checks, and these have become a breeding ground for a lot of nefarious activities that we've had in the city of New Bedford. We're not going to stand for it anymore. It's not going to happen. Uh, I know my colleagues and myself will continue to work with the mayor and the attorney floor on this. Uh, I thank attorney floor's level of engagement. I can say personally that uh, anytime we've had an issue, I forward it up to his office. They act quickly. They've acted efficiently. And more importantly, they've held that neglectful property owner or absentee landlord accountable. And that's the key. Holding these individuals accountable for not doing what's right by the city and the taxpayers of New Bedford. So again, uh, I'm all in. Uh, sometimes in government, there's checks and balances. The administration and the council might not agree on everything, but in my opinion, this is an absolute slam dunk. This is bipartisan, and we need to get this going. Thank you. All right, let me open it up for questions. Uh, 
Do you think that uh, the pending violations of code, of, of code for housing is um, in relation to any of the fires that could have happened in, in all of them, like snow fires over the summer, or is that a uh, direct cause of it? Well, there, so it depends on which ones you're referring to. Well, yeah, right? So there were some over 200 fires in the city last year. So I, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm just saying, from what you guys have found from the violations of code enforcement, is there any possibility that that could lead to a... So let me let me let me put it let me put it this way, Tim. So we so last year I asked um, the fire chief to um, to begin tracking um, and for every structure fire that the fire department um, responds to, whether you know, the structure was uh, uh, owner owned, owner occupied, and there is a there appears to be a correlation, um, which is not entirely surprising that fires are more likely in non-owner occupied property. And, and I, I just have the same question for crime. Is there any correlation with you know, code enforcement prop, you know, violation, uh, properties in violation with crime rate at all? Well, it, yes. Um, you know, the short answer is yes. And again, it's not surprising. It's, uh, and as Councilor Aber was right, uh, we, we do the, just at least anecdotally find that the, 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 the problems, the, the crime act, Criminal activity emanates from properties that are not well managed, and uh, we have we have that in spades now. That, that's what's really changed in the city, and it's not the difference. Not unique in this way, but you know, after the foreclosure, the so-called foreclosure crisis in 2008, in many cities, um, uh, housing, traditional uh, multi-family housing, was bought up by out-of-town investors, and who don't or who are, are who are investors and purely the narrow sense of the word. They're financial investors. They're not emotionally invested in either the property or the neighborhoods. And you can see it. I would ask anybody to walk up and down 9th Street, Bullard Street, Tallman Street, and, and especially when it's not snowing out, uh, and you should be able to distinguish which houses are owner-occupied and, and which ones aren't. Uh, just by the look, just by the, the way the place is kept, it's it is it's uncanny, and so uh, you know, the problem we have is that uh, unlike in days past, when, especially when those that housing was first built a hundred years ago or so, those neighborhoods are not self-regulated. There isn't you know the, you know the the um, you know the situation where you have somebody who's looking out for everybody else's kids nearly as much or or much less their own uh, the folks living in their own buildings. There's still some of that. Uh, but not nearly enough, and that's so the government has to step into that void. Uh, in the short run, and in the long run, we want to see those those neighborhoods become uh, come back by uh, taking steps to support the marketability of those pro of those properties. We want more families living in there, but for for now, uh, we have to take steps to uh, you know to regulate conduct, and that's what this is this is about. After the, I guess. Given the 14 days, the person is served and has 14 days, maybe potentially five, what happens? What, what is the city, what can the city do at that point? Yeah, so we go in, we have contractors that go in and clean up the mess, and uh, the bill is applied to the deed of the property, and when the property is sold, uh, that the, 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 somebody's going to have to pay for it. The provision, and correct me if I'm wrong, John, uh, now will allow us to put it actually on the tax bill. Right, which yes. would make it much more readily collectible. So that's another um, reform that's built into to that specific proposal. Is there anything you want to add to that at all? It's going to reduce it to five days. So it's going to be, yes. Let's add that it, it will reduce the time limit to uh, five days. So it will improve our ability to be able to get these uh, properties cleaned up, get the neighborhoods uh, back to the way they should be. And then again, it will go out on the tax bill. The person will have 30 days to pay the tax bill. And if the tax bill is not paid, then eventually or thereafter it is then placed on the, uh, the deed. It has to be paid. It will be paid. Is the same penalty applied for if they don't respond to any of, all, any of the, uh, the letters you guys send them? I know you mentioned some letters you sent them. I'm uh, sorry, say that again, Tim. I know, I know you mentioned that you send some, some property owners uh, warning letters. Uh, maybe not in particular, it's you know, like a messy home, but is that is the same response applied to, to you know, if they, if they keep sending the same property owner warning letters? Well, if you're referring to the problem property owner ordinance, the answer is. The answer is yes. If there are fees attached under that particular ordinance, if there are uh, fees assessed to the property owner for police responses and those are not paid in a timely way, then those fees would be uh, added to the tax bill. Okay. 
And so that's already built into that provision. We have a number of fine provisions in the city, some pr fine provisions in the city that don't allow for that directly. And now you know, we're, we're, we're trying to add that in everywhere so that you don't have to wait for the property be, to be, the city doesn't have to wait for the property to be sold to actually collect on those those fines or other assessments. But you know, with the complaints, eight now to four, what happens after the four complaints are not, or the eight complaints? Now? Then every, then, then uh, the police responses to those properties are on the dime of the property owner. That's how it works. It's a fee shifting, effectively a fee shifting uh, mechanism. We shift the cost away from taxpayers onto the, pro the person that's caused, that's contributing to the problem. And it's not to say, I, I will bear, it bears emphasizing that we're talking about a, a, a tiny minority of property owners in the city that cause a disproportionate amount of problems. Most of the landlords in the city are law abiding. Most of them care about their properties, but there are some that just don't. And they have to, we have to continue to take steps to get them to sit up straight. And that's what, that's what we're doing here. Um, and, you know, this is a provision that's been in place here for a couple of years. Similar provisions have been in place in other cities for longer. Ours was modeled uh, after Boston's, um, which has, does have a lower threshold. I can't remember what the threshold. Do you remember what Boston's so threshold? Either four or five. Right? Yeah. So uh, it, we set the threshold too high. And obviously, not to take care of their, you know, property. How often do they pay that those taxes and, and such? And well, like everybody else, quarterly, I presume. Yeah. But has it been successful in terms of people actually paying for those services, or do they remain unpaid as well? For you're talking about under under uh, well for the people for the city coming in and cleaning and then for the police responses. So well, well you you tell me if I get this wrong, but under the clean and lean provision currently, um, it, there there is not a mechanism to put the assessment on taxes. We're proposing to include that now. Okay. Right? Okay. Right. So otherwise, it's just put on. It, it's attached as a lien on the property and filed in the, the registry of deeds and wouldn't become due until the property is actually sold. Okay. Um, with respect to the problem property ordinance, we have, we have not, I mean, the reality is that we have not had occasion to assess anybody yet. We've sent out warning letters, but because the threshold was set so high, and I won't go back into like why, why that happened in the course of uh, the legislative process last time, uh, but you know, the reality is it was set too high. And so we have, you know, although we've sent out warning letters, and I think the warning letters have had some beneficial effect, the reality is that it's, uh, you know, we, haven't had, we haven't had occasion to, to assess somebody for, any, anybody for the police responses to their property. Is that is yeah. accurate? No. Does the severity of the, the, the crime or the calling for the police to go to a home scale the amount of times they, they go there? So like, they go there for noise, is it the same if they go there for domestic violence or something like that? No, it's to say it's a valid complaint if it's a misdemeanor or a felony under Massachusetts law. That's 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 what counts. So it doesn't matter how many other crimes. Yeah, it could be for disturbing the pieces, or it could be you know for axe murderers. It doesn't you know it does doesn't matter. Is there a time period in which this? Whether it's there are twelve the preceding twelve months. Okay. Yeah. yeah, we can Mike, we can give you some of the John can fill in some of the, sure. the, the okay. background on that. Uh, we've done a lot of work on it. Maybe we just share with. Like the uh, the original cover letter the, when the thing first passed, that lays it lays out the theory. All right. Is there uh, any other questions? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thanks for your support. Thank you. Very much.